Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we speak with Dave Sweeney of the Australian Conservation Foundation. He brings us up to speed on Australia's nuclear past, its direct connection with Fukushima, how the indigenous Aboriginal people have been fighting against mining interests that want to impinge upon their land, and the background on international plans to turn Australia into the nuclear waste dump of the planet. He has a lot to say about that. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck, and cover report on all the accidents of the past week, and more honest nuclear information than could be found at last weekend's taping of Antiques Roadshow in Palm Springs, California. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, August 9, 2016. And here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in Japan, where this past week marked commemorations for the dropping of the atom bombs by the United States on Japan, first in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, and three days later on Nagasaki on August 9th. Nagasaki Mayor Tomohisa Tuawe urged the international community to realize a world without nuclear weapons. In his peace declaration, delivered in an annual ceremony in the city's Peace Park, Tuawe said new frameworks aimed at containing nuclear proliferation are necessary if mankind is not to destroy its future. He said, Now is the time for all of you to bring together as much of your collective wisdom as you possibly can and act. Regarding the Hiroshima commemorative event, regarding the commemorative event in Hiroshima, which is broadcast live every year by NHK, Japan's national television, this year it dropped the broadcast in order to cover the Olympics. And the Secretary General of the Japan Confederation of A Bomb and H Bomb Sufferers Organizations who had praised the speech given by U.S. President Barack Obama during his recent visit to Hiroshima, now says he regretted that praise after learning the content of the speech in more detail. Terumi Tanaka, who is 84, had only heard and not read the speech when asked at a post-ceremony press conference for his opinion. He remembered a sentence that struck him, which was, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are known as the start of our own moral awakening. And he praised that sentence as excellent words. Only later did he read the beginning of the speech, which said in part, Seventy-one years ago, on a bright cloudless morning, death fell from the sky and the world was changed. Tanaka said, Death did not fall from the sky. They created death. As a sign of apology, I want them to eliminate nuclear weapons. There's an excellent compilation of information that Mining Awareness has posted online on the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan. We'll have a link to it up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 268. It's a sign of the times in Japan that Tubes of stable iodine jelly meant for use by infants, which would prevent radioactive iodine from being absorbed into their systems, will be stockpiled for emergencies in municipalities near nuclear power plants around Japan. The government will start distributing 300,000 doses of emergency iodine stock to the municipalities within a 30-kilometer that's about an 18-mile radius from the nuclear plants, in the event of major nuclear accidents. There are about 115,000 infants under the age of three in those municipalities. Yet, of course, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby and his cohorts are all saying nukes are perfectly safe. But as this move indicates, maybe not. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat... 
Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. Surfs up and reasons down in Fukushima. On July 17, a national surf contest was held in Manamisoma, Fukushima, which is only 30 kilometers or 18 miles away from the three Fukushima Daiichi reactors, which melted down and continue to pour 300,000 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean every day. Under the title Recovery Festival, more than 200 participants gathered from all over Japan to be able to surf in the radioactive waters. Yes, there were categories for kids' competition, with children as young as fourth graders, eight or nine-year-olds, all the way up to old farts of 64. Apparently, the propaganda by Prime Minister Abe Baby's LDP, Labor Democratic Party, has taken hold so much that people of the surfing persuasion have given up on all common sense. Speaking of which, they're not the only ones, because on August 3rd, the International Olympic Committee, which is the group behind the 2020 Tokyo No Olympic Games, has formally voted to include surfing as a gold medal sport. Excuse me, guys. This is crazy. You're going to have elite athletes, surfers from around the world, go into that radioactive water. We know it's radioactive. The plume has already hit in British Columbia. We know that through Fairwinds Energy Education and Maggie Gunderson. But hey, dude, you got to catch the waves. They are awesome. That's actually what the head of the International Surfing Association said. Quote, it is awesome that our incredible athletes will have the opportunity to showcase their talents and skills to the global Olympic audience and compete for their countries. That's two Olympics in a row where you don't want to drink the water or breathe the air. So whether it's the ISA, the surfing organization, the International Olympic Committee, or those beach boys and girls on their surfboards who just want to have a good time in the summer, you are all this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. Back over here to the U.S., where researchers have found a 12-year life expectancy gap in North St. Louis County. The analysis of census tracts by Virginia Commonwealth University showed that the highest life expectancy in this area was 81 and the lowest 69. Lead researcher Derek Chapman said that even small geographic areas have disparities for how long people live, and it's often tied to income. He went on to say, place-based factors refer to things like access to grocery stores and parks, which make eating well and working out more convenient. Or it can be something like air pollution, which tends to concentrate in low-income areas. Not a single mention of the proximity to the West Lake landfill with its illegally buried World War II weapons waste and an underground fire in the adjacent Bridgeton landfill bearing down upon it or the radioactive contamination of Coldwater Creek, which runs through the area. Not a single mention. He did say, however, that the issues of health are generational and cannot be fixed overnight. Donald Trump, who is the Republican, it hurts my mouth to say this, candidate for President of the United States, was in an advisory meeting with a foreign policy expert who works on the international level, and three separate times Donald Trump asked this expert about the use of nuclear weapons, at one point saying, if we have them, why can't we use them? In response, National security expert John Noonan, who previously had advised Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney, went on a Twitter rant that we will link to on NuclearHotSeat.com. This episode's number 288. It's well worth the read because Noonan knows what he's talking about, and clearly Trump doesn't. Just catching up with this story, on May 26th, 
the Oglala Sioux Tribe and activist scored a big win when federal administrative judges ruled that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff had failed to take a hard look at cultural resources in recommending renewal of a uranium mining license for Crow Butte Mine. The decision delays permitting. The tribe argued that the NRC staff recommended approval in violation of its rights under National Historic Preservation Act and National Environmental Protection Act. Nancy Kyle, an Oglala activist in the Sisterhood to Protect Water, said, Woo-hoo! A federal agency determined a foreign company did not properly consult with First Nations. Crow Butte Mine is owned by the Canadian Cameco Company, the world's largest publicly traded uranium mining company, which is currently facing federal tax dodging allegations in its home country and an investigation by the Internal Revenue Service over $32 million in U.S. back taxes. In Washington State, that wildfire that was threatening the Hanford Reservation, one of the most contaminated and radioactive sites in the world, has now been 100% contained, though it is still burning. And now it's time for the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report, wherein we take a look at everything that has been going wrong with the nuclear reactors sitting smack dab in the middle of our communities. At Byron in Illinois on August 2nd, a diesel generator watertight door was discovered open and unattended, which meant it wasn't exactly watertight. This is an event or condition that could have prevented fulfillment of a safety function of structures or systems that are needed to mitigate the consequences of an accident. <coughs> At McGuire in North Carolina on August 2nd, the technical support center ventilation was out of service, which negatively affects the functionality of an emergency response facility. <coughs> Dispensing with the duck calls now because there are just too many of these suckers this week. At Hope Creek in New Jersey on August 7th, high-pressure coolant injection system declared inoperable. At Fermion, Michigan on August 2nd, it was found that the secondary containment pressure boundary was not met an event or condition that could have prevented the fulfillment of a safety function needed to control the release of radioactive material. Fire safety shutdown problems were found at Browns Ferry in Alabama, Farley in Alabama, and two separate problems at Monticello in Minnesota. A battery room fire detection system was declared inoperable, and an unanalyzed fire barrier meant that a fire in the administration building could require evacuation of the control room. At the Westinghouse Uranium Fuel Fabrication Facility in Columbia, South Carolina, the bad news grows on degraded safety items caused by uranium buildup. 87 kilograms of uranium in the scrubber, way more than specs call for. In scrubber packing, on the floor, and residual material was located within a scrubber that was taken out of service in 2002. You wonder why we say these things are aging, broken, and falling apart? This is the proof. <coughs> in China, thousands of people have taken to the streets of the Anyungang to protest against a possible French-Chinese nuclear fuel recycling project. Communist Party officials this week responded with warnings that the demonstrators are illegal and cautioned party members not to join them or even watch or discuss them online, at risk of being seriously investigated and dealt with. At the same time, officials promised to be transparent about the project. Yeah. In Greenland, when the U.S. military abandoned Camp Century, they left behind thousands of tons of waste, including radioactive materials. They expected the detritus would be safely entombed in the ice sheet for tens of thousands of years, buried ever deeper under accumulating layers of snow and ice. Surprise! Global warming now threatens to expose that material much, much sooner, possibly even by the end of this century. Something else for the grandkids to look forward to. We'll have the week's featured interview in just a moment, but first... I've been telling you about the Excellence in Journalism Conference, which is coming up in mid-September in New Orleans. That's where I plan to be 
along with over 1,000 other journalists, broadcasters, news directors, syndicators, those who book guests for news programs. And I have the clear intention that I'm going to meet with as many of them as I can, say the word nuclear, and do what I can to get them to cover our issues in greater depth and frequency. I have been raising the money to attend, and thank you very much to those of you who have been generous in your donations and helping me get there. The plane ticket is booked, my fees are paid for the events, and we are closing in on the rest of the expenses that I'm going to have to cover. I'm getting close. Not there yet. Still need your help. So won't you consider making a donation to Nuclear Hot Seat? Donations are the lifeblood of this program because without it, we wouldn't be able to pay our monthly bills. And beyond that, I would not be able to travel to some of the important events to get coverage and, in this instance, plant the seeds that can hopefully grow into better coverage for us all in the future. So, won't you help? It's easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can choose to do a cup of coffee donation, the equivalent of sitting down and buying me a cup with a good tip for the barista. You can make that a monthly, or you can make it something larger. Surprise me. Surprise yourself, maybe. Whatever you choose to do, all donations, every donation, is a sign of your support for the energy and the effort that goes into doing this program. And also, your interest in getting me into some very interesting situations so that I can bring you back the story and maybe plant a few of our own. It's easy to donate. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. You can donate by PayPal, by using your credit card, and if you prefer to do it the old-fashioned way, by check, shoot an email to me at info at NuclearHotSeat.com and I'll send you back a snail mail address you can use to send it to me. Whatever you can do to help, know that you've got my gratitude because not only will it get me to excellence in journalism to do the work, it's a tangible show of support for the work itself. And so I thank you. At last year's World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City, I met today's interviewee. I grabbed a short interview with him while standing in line for lunch and vowed to one day get a longer one. That day came as the issue of where to put nuclear waste has been heating up and pointing possibly to using Australia as the world's nuclear waste dump. That's when I knew it was time to get in touch with Dave Sweeney. Dave has been active in the uranium mining and nuclear debate for two decades through his work with the media trade unions, and environmental groups on mining, resource, and indigenous issues. He works as a national nuclear campaigner for the Australian Conservation Foundation and holds a vision of a nuclear-free Australia that is positive about its future and honest about its past. What he had to say was so rich, and we talked for so long, that the interview has been broken into two pieces— the first half of which you will hear this week, the second half of which will be on next week's show, Nuclear Hot Seat number 268. Dave Sweeney, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much, Livy. It's a good seat to be sitting in right now. It seems odd that Australia, a country that has no nuclear facilities for generating electricity, has played such a large role in the nuclear world. Give us some of the background, focusing on the uranium mining industry within the country. Yeah, we're absolutely right. Australia has no domestic nuclear power facilities, but we do play a significant role, and that's because we have the largest known world reserve of the fuel that makes nuclear possible. We are home to around 35 to 40% of the world's uranium. And we have been, for many years, a significant uranium producer. We were around 20% of the global market. We now provide around 10% of the global market in mined uranium. And Australia has used the existence of 
that mineral product to also then play, if you like, a significant role in nuclear politics globally, a, a member of the IAE Board of Governors and raising its voice on all sorts of nuclear issues, sometimes occasionally in a responsible way, more and more in an irresponsible way and in a way that fuels the expansion of the industry. Speaking of the expansion of the industry, how large is it? What proportion of the gross national product of industry within Australia does it represent? Well, a lot of your listeners would be aware that Australia is very much a resource-based economy. We mine and export many products and commodities. Uranium is one of those, but although it has a very significant political influence, it's a small player in the mineral sector, really. The export value of uranium is around $650 million Australian dollars a year. Now, that's about 0.3% of Australia's national export revenue. But maybe to put it in an easier way, we dig a lot of minerals. We dig a lot of iron ore, which becomes steel. We export to the value of around $52 billion Australian dollars of iron ore a year. We dig a lot of coal which is used for electricity and fuels climate change, we export around $48 billion of coal a year. And we dig uranium, 10% of the market, and we export uranium worth $700 million a year. So if you put coal and iron ore together, it's over $100 billion. If you put uranium there, which plays on the same stage or attempts to politically here for influence... It's 700 million. So it's a minnow when it comes to jobs. There's less than 1,000 jobs. It's a minnow when it comes to revenue. It's $700 million export revenue. But it's a whale when it comes to risk here and overseas. It was Australian uranium that fueled Fukushima. We know it's confirmed in the Australian Parliament by our nuclear safety watchdog that it was Australian uranium that was loaded in the Fukushima reactor when the reactor failed and melted down. So when you hear Fukushima fallout, that accident actually started in the back of a big yellow truck in an Australian uranium mine. And so we are deeply concerned as Australians who want to see a movement away from the nuclear industry and responsible and clean and sustainable energy future around the planet. We see the future as renewable, not radioactive. Given the impact and the severity of what this fuel becomes, what this rock becomes as it goes further and further down the nuclear chain. As Australian activists, as Australian people who want to see this country stop playing a negative role in fueling an industry that is so contaminating and contentious that causes so much heartache and risk, we are very committed to working to remove Australia from supplying the start fuel of this risky trade and, and ending uranium mining. Let's talk history for a little bit so we can get oriented. What is the background of uranium mining in Australia and when did the modern era of Australian uranium mining begin? Yeah, well, there was radium mining and there was mining in different places and over time from the early part of the 1900s through. But the modern era largely began in the 1970s in the north of Australia, particularly in an area that some listeners might know around called Kakadu National Park. It's Australia's largest national park. It's a magnificent area of sandstone escarpment sweeping down to massive floodplains and big winding crocodile and barramundi filled rivers going out to the northern cape and the area in the 70s was identified as a significant uranium reserve or prospectivity and so what happened then was an, a clash that has continued since the clash between conservation and reserve and protect areas between Indigenous rights and Aboriginal people's aspirations and between the Australian mining industry and government's desire to exploit uranium. And in the 1970s, the Ranger project was developed. It became operational in the late 70s, early 1980s, and it was basically a trade-off. It was effectively done of like, yes, you can have Aboriginal land rights. Yes, you can have a large national park. But the deal is that you say yes to uranium mining at Ranger 
and to the potential for future uranium mining at a set of other identified uranium deposits within this area. So that sort of tension between industrial development, protection of country and recognition of the aspirations and rights of Australia's First Nations was started then and it continues today. And what we've had in that time since the early 1980s when commercial production at Ranger started till now is a long history of uranium operations in northern Australia and also in southern Australia, a large operation owned by the world's largest miner, BHP Billiton, in, in South Australia. And they've always been contested. They've always been controversial. There's been site-specific impacts over tailings management, water depletion, water contamination. It's an issue in this country, Libby, that has always generated heartache and headlines. It really sounds like business as usual for the nuclear industry because that's the way they operate around the world. With the number of mines that have been created and are in use in Australia, have any of them been rehabilitated? Have they been neutralized and made safe? Or is such a thing even possible? That's a really interesting question and and the short answer is no to both. No, none have been effectively rehabilitated and no, I doubt that it's possible in the Australian context at least. The situation has been that there was a, a spate in the 1950s and 60s of quick early shallow and dirty mining in in Australia where there was a bit of a rush. Uranium was seen as the Midas metal and lots of small companies got into different places, extracted largely shallow deposits and left. Now most of those mining operations have been fenced off, there's signs on the outside, there has been some remedial earthworks done to address the worst sort of runoff and they're effectively left. There were a couple of significant mining operations in Australia's history. One called Mary Kathleen, another called Rum Jungle, a third called Narbalek, which are different mines scattered across the Northern Territory and Queensland in the northern part of Australia, where there have been really quite significant attempts at rehabilitation. There have then been assurances and people have walked around with the clipboard and ticked it off and said, yes, this is fine, it's good. And then when more independent analysis has happened and when it's been tracked over time, what was said to be complete and comprehensive and competent has shown itself to be none of those things. All of those sites have significant continuing and unresolved issues with leachate of sulfides, of contaminants, of radionuclides, heavy metal mobilisation, acid mine drainage, water contamination, the non-isolation of radioactive tailings. So there's really considerable concerns there. And just recently, just in the most recent federal budget in Australia, another $10 $10 million was allocated to a further study to look at options to try and further rehabilitate and quarantine the Rum Jungle project. And it is becoming increasingly apparent that that will take at least a decade and a further at least $200 million Australian dollars to try and bring it back into any shape that is even roughly parallel to acceptable. So what we've seen is mining operations 50 years after they've happened and 20 years after they've been signed off as clean are being continually running sores and weeping spots. So we have no history of good mine closure in Australia in relation to the uranium sector. We have no good, adequate and robust regulation. We have a poor track record. The Closure and exit from the uranium sector is often underplanned and often underfunded. And the companies involved, Libby, often they have a limited capacity, a limited commitment, and there's also, concerningly, limited accountability. I suppose the take-home message from the Australian experience is even with all the checks and balances we've had, all the skills and technology and dollars that we've got and we've put into the sector – country has never been and is never properly cleaned up. Things are never as good as they were before mining started 
and in most, if not all cases, they are considerably and consistently worse. What, if anything, is known about the health impact of these mines on local populations and on those miners who actually worked on them? That, again, is a very basic question and a very good question and one that is very difficult to answer. And it's difficult to answer primarily because the hard data is missing. We have been mining uranium in Australia for many decades now and it's only in recent years that there has been a cohesive national register of radiation workers. Up until that time, individual records of individual workers were effectively their responsibility and as you can imagine, it's a highly itinerant, often young men workforce and uh, young men often think they're bulletproof and they're not particularly fast or worried, and they're certainly not looking about keeping records of today as to something that might make itself manifest in 30 or 40 years. So we have a dearth of data about exposure levels. We know that there have been exposures to workers. We know a whole range of concerns. There's a vast body of anecdotal concerns within union organisations and within workers as well. And it was advocacy from those groups as well as public health groups and environment organisations like ours that helped foster the climate that made the National Register happen. So that's a start, but it's a long way from the end. In relation to communities, again, there is nearly negligible community health monitoring. There are Aboriginal communities near mine sites. In the case of Olympic Dam, there's a township within 20 kilometres, a large township, 20 kilometres from the mine site. Negligible community health monitoring. And again, a high rotation at a mining town. People come in, uh, there might be single men, they stay a couple of years and they move on. They might have young families and kids who are particularly vulnerable, but they move on after three or four or five years. And, and that sort of train that sort of line of tracking and monitoring gets very easily lost. There has been one study by a group of Australian epidemiologists or oncologists and cancer researchers, a group of them joined for a study on cancer amongst the Aboriginal population of Kakadu near the range of mine, the area nearest to the range of uranium mine, Australia's longest running continuing mine. And what that found is that whereas Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory have a cancer rate which is twice that of the non-Aboriginal community, the Aboriginal community right by the mine site had a cancer rate that was twice that again of the already double high Aboriginal rate. So it was a very significant statistical difference that highlighted an excess in cancers. And there's many anecdotal stories of ill health, cancers, strange diseases, illnesses, etc. Now, it was requested by those researchers that there be a more detailed study that had a broader methodology, a bigger cohort, better testing, and both the federal government and the Northern Territory government refused to advance that. It was a modest amount of money, uh, less than 500000 Australian dollars a year to do it. And despite requests from Aboriginal organisations and national environment groups and public health groups, the governments ignored that and didn't advance that. Now, it has, in the last year or two, just started to be picked up again and is going to be looked at. But it is a really indicative example of indifference and an uh, example of the questions that are too hard don't like to be asked in the Australian mining sector. I know we haven't got a monopoly on that, but people would rather have a radon meter that measures whether it's blowing west, east or north or south than have a detailed study about health impacts of communities or health impacts of workers. So we're concerned about that. We're also concerned because some of the more cowboy companies have even facilitated speaking tours and presentations to their workers by really disreputable medical analysis that 
promotes hormesis, the theory that a bit of radiation exposure is good for you. And they talk these tired arguments again and again that you will get more exposure to nuclear materials by eating a banana which contains radioactive potassium than you will by working a shift at a uranium mine. There is a consistent ignorance and a consistent belittling coupled with an institutional history of failing to gather hard data and ask hard questions, which really reduces our confidence in the regulation and the governance of this sector. And if I can give you one more example, Libby, of this. We know that Australian uranium directly fuelled Fukushima, and when the UN did its system-wide study into Fukushima in September 2011, one of the recommendations that the UN Secretary General made for countries that produce uranium was that they carry out a cost-benefit analysis of the sector with a particular emphasis on two aspects. One, the environmental impacts in the area around the mine site and two, the community and worker health impacts in and around the mining operations. And we said, thank the goddess, we at last have strong impeccable international organisation source calling for what we've been calling for for decades, for a detailed and independent analysis of the impacts around mine site, of the impacts on workers and of the impacts on affected communities. And successive Australian federal governments have flatly refused to address this or advance this and the companies involved in mining uranium in Australia have flatly refused to address it or advance it, have said this is not our responsibility, this is a matter for the national government. Everyone is hand-passing and pointing to the other one to do the role and there is this happy little circle in the boys' club of let's just get on and try and get back to business as usual and the reality is after Fukushima there is no business as usual with this sector. One of the things I find not shocking about this, not amazing, but just dumbfounded about it is that the techniques and the handing off and the lack of accountability and the lack of cleaning up and all of that is the exact same playbook that is used in every national interview that I have done. The report has been from Canada, from the miners in Saskatchewan, from the Navajo miners in the American Southwest. Africa, when we were talking about the mining that had been done there, the exploration of mining. In every case, they leave the waste, they leave the radioactivity, the local communities who are usually First Nations, Aboriginal, Native people of color. So there is a racial genocide aspect to this. It can be viewed that way. That is all part of what they do. And when it comes to responsibility, it's a hot potato and they'll pass it to somebody else and just keep that carousel going over and over again. That is absolutely the case. We don't think in any way that um, we're Robinson Crusoe in Australia. We're very aware that this is the model of the extractive industry in general, but the uranium industry have turned it into a template art form. And it's a real concern for us. Like We highlight and harass this industry quite effectively. We use the checks and balances that do exist in Australia, which, you know, in the uncertain world we live in, Australia is a pretty blessed country and we're aware of that. And we have an independent media. We have non-government organisations, free trade unions. We have resourced Indigenous and First Nations groups that have, you know, fire in feisty and articulate activists. We have a parliament that has at least some people with some semblance of responsibility and maturity. Now, all these things are constrained. None of them are perfect, but they all exist and they don't always exist in other places. And we use each and every one of them to the full extent that we can, Libby, to try and draw attention to the impacts on country and the impacts on people that this industry brings here and abroad. We use these triggers and these lever points to try and highlight and halt this industry. And we try and make it accountable and responsible because it is profoundly irresponsible. But even with all those things, we are still fighting a defensive battle 
And our concern very much is in many countries and, and many jurisdictions, and, and we watch Australian companies operating offshore and we work with colleagues, particularly in Africa and elsewhere, to try and track their behaviour, which is often appalling. It really shows that it is again and again the on-ground active tracking and engagement and resistance of Aboriginal people, of working people and of civil society that is the most effective check and balance on this sector. It's not enough, but it's a whole lot better than nothing and it is growing and it makes a real difference. The plus side of that is that it is a, a credit to those who are engaged in that to hold the beast in some sort of check. The minor side of that is that all these assurances, all these promises and resources, all these talk about governance and transparency and accountability and codes of practice and toughest legislation, really when push comes to shove, in the mining sector there is a triple bottom line of pounds, dollars and euros. The thing that counts is the stuff that you count. And that is a deep concern here and all around the world. How have the Aboriginal people traditionally responded to uranium mining? The overwhelming response has been one of, at a minimum, deep caution and very often active and strong opposition. Aboriginal people in Australia have lived, documented, carbon dated 70,000 years in this country. It's the oldest continuing culture on earth and it's an amazing fusion of skills and sense of place and sense of respect and sense of what is possible and what is sustainable. Aboriginal people have a deep, deep sense of place and of looking back and looking forward while living in the present. And there is often a correlation between Aboriginal stories about danger sites or sites to avoid or warning areas and the location and proximity of uranium mineralisation. In Australia, when the Ranger Mine started, Aboriginal people, the Mirar people of Kakadu, strongly opposed that mining. They argued very powerfully against it and their opposition was not allowed to prevail. Their opposition was actively overridden and laws were changed to remove any legal power that they might have to stop that mine. So we had then, right from the first of the modern period of uranium mining in Australia, a really clear example of the landscape which has largely persisted since, which is Aboriginal concern and opposition. That concern is heard but not heeded. It's heard but not respected by the authorities. And all the weight of the state goes to facilitate the mining company and the mining operation. The Aboriginal people are broken, bribed, bypassed, bullied. And that practice or model has largely continued. If you look at nearly every site where there's uranium proposed or uranium being mined in Australia, there is active Aboriginal opposition. Also, in that time, some of that opposition has sadly not been successful. Although when you fight for your country and you fight to protect your culture, even a loss is actually a win because you are still defending and representing, you are still respecting and reflecting. So that's important. But in the world of tonnage and whether the mine got approved and whether it started, sometimes Aboriginal opposition has been unsuccessful. But sometimes it has also been spectacularly successful. There's a couple of points that you can point to, particularly in the Northern Territory, where there was a massive international campaign in the late 1990s and through the early part of the 2000s to stop mining at Jabaluka, right next to the ranger site. That was successful because of the Mirar people. There was an amazing international scale Indigenous rights and conservation rights success just a few years ago, Libby, at a place called Kungara, again in Kakadu where the senior traditional owner of that country, a man called Geoffrey Lee, had been arguing with the French company Arriva for many years and refusing them consent to further develop on his country a very rich uranium project. 
And eventually a combination of circumstances and pressure meant that there was enough political will generated and enough political resignation accepted amongst pro-nuclears that Jeffrey's land was able to be formally folded into Kakadu National Park and protected forever. And I know that that man, who's not a rich man, he has a part-time job as a park ranger, that man was personally offered multiple millions of dollars. Take it, have it, walk away. And he said no to that, really big inducements, and he said yes to protecting his country and, and fortunately he was being able to and that's a really good news story. There's another place, Angela Pamela, down near Alice Springs, some listeners might know, nearly right in the middle of Australia, where again the Canadian company Cameco wanted to have a, a uranium project just 20 k's, 20 kilometres from the town town of 35,000 people in the middle of the desert and they wanted to have it just above the aquifer that gives the water for that town and Aboriginal people led a very spirited defence that saw the company decide that it was too hard and the margins just weren't worth it when you had that level of extra added complication, delay and cost. And that's happening now right across Western Australia where there is very strong resistance to plans to expand uranium mining in that state and it's being led and driven by Aboriginal people. So there are many, many strong Aboriginal leaders who are driving and and strongly against uranium mining. And just to fuse this together, one of the things that I think is a really inspirational initiative in Australia at the moment and one that might be of a lot of interest to listeners or to people in similar situation is a network here called ANFA, the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance. And that's a network that has now been running for nearly two decades, unfunded, self-funded, but it involves multiple Aboriginal communities, organisations and individuals working in a loose alliance with public health organisations, some progressive trade unions and many civil society groups looking at how to most effectively support communities in saying no to nuclear developments on their country. And the important thing there is that fuses that concern that Aboriginal people have with that concern too that non-Aboriginal people have. And it it becomes like a, a form in a sense, Libya, a positive story of radioactive reconciliation and black and white in this country working together for a better vision of this country. Let's move this forward into the issue that seems to come present when people outside of Australia think of Australia, and that is radioactive waste. It does appear from the outside that there are forces within Australia that want to make your country the nuclear waste dump for the planet. What is the situation like in Australia for radioactive waste? Well, as we mentioned earlier, Australia doesn't have any commercial or civilian nuclear power reactors. So we have avoided, fortunately, that whole problem and waste stream. We do have a radioactive waste inventory or stockpile in Australia, which is mainly created through the operation of a small 20 megawatt reactor which is used for radiopharmaceutical and industrial isotope production near Sydney. Now that obviously uses and generates spent fuel and that obviously generates a long-lived radioactive waste. So on a national level, it's a small but significant amount of long-lived intermediate and low-level radioactive waste, which our national government has comprehensively failed to responsibly deal with for 25 years now, Libby. Since the uh, early 1990s, in this country, there has been a search to find a suitable site for a national facility to bury the lower level waste and to store the um, higher level waste. And that's targeted multiple sites in the Northern Territory and South Australia in particular. It's always targeted Aboriginal lands. It's always followed the same flawed and failed pattern of announcing from Canberra that this seems to fit the model this seems to tick the boxes and we intend to do this. And then a local community hears about it, approaches civil society and in nuclear free groups and seeks support, gains support. There's a campaign that might run from one year to five years. And then the caravan from Canberra, our national capital, says it's too hard and moves on. 
So we still have this unresolved issue and that's playing as it is. We're calling the environment groups, the civil society and public health groups are calling for the government to stop being concerned and obsessed with finding a postcode and instead have a proper process. We accept and understand that we have radioactive waste in Australia. We know better than many of the bureaucrats that that brings with it a responsibility to maturely and effectively manage that material. Above all, you stop creating it, but the stuff that exists, you need to responsibly manage. Now, we are prepared to engage in that dialogue and to work out what are the options, what are the range of alternatives, what are the different techniques and opportunities that there could be to do that. What we're not prepared to do is sit by and let political expedience couple with bullying and try and voice this, impose this, on the land of some of the poorest and most marginalised people in this country. So we have fought long and hard alongside and beside Aboriginal communities successfully over many years. So hopefully there will be a circuit breaker in the national debate and we'll move on a bit. That was Dave Sweeney, National Nuclear Campaigner for the Australian Conservation Foundation. Next week we will have part two of this interview, which includes a late-breaking update on how Rupert Murdoch and some long-planted nuclear propagandists have been building pressure for Australia to consider nuclear waste the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's a global perspective that impacts all of us who are involved with this issue. And once you learn what's been going on, it could be a game-changer, though not the way the other side thinks. That will be on Nuclear Hot Seat number 269, posting next Tuesday, August 16. In the meantime, we will have a link up to the Australian Conservation Foundation on this week's program, Nuclear Hot Seat number 268. Activist shout-outs, and we've got some real good ones this week. Congratulations are in order to Jackie Cabasso, Executive Director of the Western States Legal Foundation in Oakland, Marilea Kelly, the executive director of Tri-Valley Cares in Livermore, and Tom Webb, who is regional coordinator of Pox Christi, North California. Together they wrote the article, Must Demand That Nuclear Armed States Disarm, that appeared in the East Bay Times. It was five columns across, they got great placement, and it was timed, of course, for last week's anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well done. Demonstrating that there is absolutely no limit to what senior citizens can achieve, Beth Rosedatter was arrested on August 6th after blocking the road to the Y-12 nuclear weapons complex in Tennessee. She was charged with obstructing a highway and was later released from jail with an August 17 court date. Prior to sitting in the road, where, by the way, she was wearing a shirt that read, There is no place in the world for nuclear weapons. Before that, she had participated in the Oak Ridge Environmental Peace Alliance's Names and Remembrance Ceremony that marked the 71st anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan. The highly enriched uranium that fueled the little boy bomb was produced at the Y-12 site. Beth Rosedatter now joins with Sister Megan Rice in having performed meaningful and very visible protest at the Y-12 site. And in the Northeast, where old reactors needing costly repairs and upgrades are being propped up literally by the state, Tim Judson, the head of NEARS, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, did a groundbreaking analysis to show that not spending that money on old nukes, but instead investing it in energy efficiency and renewable generation, could replace nuclear power and there would be more energy in the grid that New York could also close coal. All of this from not buying into the keeping of nukes online. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, are you listening? Here's today's final thought, and I'm afraid it's not very profound. My computer printer died a really painful death 
in the middle of printing out my source material for the show. And it took me several, actually too many, really frustrating hours to get the pages printed. I'm finishing up recording at an o'clock that I don't even want to mention, so that my final thought is, I need sleep. It's been a long day. We've talked about nukes enough for now. But don't worry. It will all be right there where we left it in the morning. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 9, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from deunrenard.wordpress.com, japantimes.com, mainichi.jp, worldsurfleague.com, asahi.com, miningawareness.wordpress.com, stlpublicradio.org, dailycause.com, slate.com, Tri-Valley Cares, Western States Legal Foundation, American Friends Service Committee, nsweekly.com, wsj.com, nuclear-news.net, climatecentral.org, theglobeandmail.com, theguardian.com, safecast.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the brilliant, compassionate, serious yet fun-loving anti-nuclear activists from all over the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are invited to join us. Like us. You can really, really like us and share our post with your family and friends. Thanks also this week to Nuclear Hot Seat friends Kathy Iwane, Kumar Sundaram, and Hervé Courtois for items that they sent that we were able to use. Theme music written by me, sung by Meryl Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewZSentinel.com, and broadcast on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We are always looking for stations and networks to connect with, so if you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, or maybe they don't know they would like to carry the show, but you can talk them into it. Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com and let me know all about it. You can check out our archive of over 265 shows on the website nuclearhotseat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcast, where the posting glitch has been corrected and we are now up to date on the episodes. If you sign up on the website, you will receive an email link to each week's Nuclear Hot Seat episode delivered right there to your email inbox of choice. And as a bonus, you'll also receive a chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond. The full book is available on Amazon. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat, the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please... Do what you can this week to help us out with a donation of any size at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. Like I like to say every week, this is Libby Halevi of Heart Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that, amazingly enough, Nuclear Hot Seat is now downloaded every month in 112 countries. So if you think you're alone with your concerns about the issue, you have friends and compatriots around the world. The activists are linking because we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. 
It's the bomb.